Nestled among the rolling plains of Wiltshire in England, Stonehenge stands as a testament to the ingenuity and determination of our prehistoric ancestors. This iconic stone circle, one of the most famous and instantly recognizable landmarks in the world, has continued to captivate the imagination of historians, archaeologists, and the thousands of visitors for centuries. Its massive stones arranged in concentric circles and horseshoe shapes are a marvel of Neolithic engineering and Bronze Age craftsmanship, drawing millions of visitors to its site each year to wonder at its mysteries. Welcome back to the channel, I'm the ASMR historian, once more a pleasure to have you here. You would have guessed by now the topic of today's video, Stonehenge. I advise you to get relaxed, make yourself comfortable, and allow me to take you back 5,000 years ago. The origins of Stonehenge date back to that time indeed, with the site undergoing several phases of construction and modification from around 3000 BC to 1600 BC. The monument we see today is the result of complex building efforts that have spanned for several centuries including the transportation and careful arrangement of blue stones from the Preseli Hills in Wales, over 150 miles away, and of course the massive Saracen stones quarried from the nearby Marlborough Downs. The purpose and builders of Stonehenge remain subjects of speculation and debate even to this day. While it is clear that the monument's alignment with the solstices point to its significance as an astronomical calculator, or perhaps an observatory, other theories suggest that it served as a sacred site for burial rites, healing rituals, and social gatherings, as indeed it does in our modern era today. The builders of Stonehenge, a people without written records, left us with no direct evidence of their intentions, imbuing the monument with an aura of mystery that continues to captivate us all the way to our modern era. Well, despite the many theories, the true significance of Stonehenge and the identity of his creators remain enigmatic, and whoever created it certainly had a remarkable human achievement under their belt. Its construction phases from the earliest earthworks to the final setting of stones reflect a society that was capable of organizing the labor of hundreds, if not indeed thousands, of individuals towards a common and well-planned goal. The enduring legacy of Stonehenge lies not just in its architectural grandeur, but in its testament to the complexity and the depth of prehistoric culture. As we delve deeper into the story of Stonehenge, we will explore the landscape that shaped its construction, the people who built it, and the theories that attempt 
to unravel its many secrets. Throughout this journey, I invite you to step back in time to a world where ancient stones tell stories of human endeavor, celestial observance, and a deep, deep connection to the land. Before the iconic silhouette of Stonehenge defined the Salisbury Plain, this expanse of chalk grassland was already indeed a canvas for human expression and behavior. The landscape with its wide horizons and gently undulating hills bore witness to the activities of the ancient peoples long before the first stone of Stonehenge was even erected. The place in question, the Salisbury Plain, especially the area surrounding Stonehenge, was a hub of Neolithic and Bronze Age activity, suggesting a profound significance to the people who lived there. The land was marked not just by Stonehenge, but various prehistoric monuments, burial mounds, and ceremonial pathways, alluding to a rich tapestry of ritual and communal life that predated the earliest trace of the stone monuments. Well, how did it all start? We have to have some kind of idea. Well, allow me to explain it very slowly. The earliest construction phase at Stonehenge dates back to around 3000 BC, beginning with the creation of a circular earthenwork enclosure. That's right, 3000 BC. So that's 5024 years ago. Perhaps we can lay some credence to give or take several hundred years. But, for the sake of being polite to the researchers who have arrived at this number, we will just make an even round up to 3000 BC. Well, the initial endeavor involved the excavation of a ditch and the construction of an external bank, as well as the Aubrey Holes, a ring of 56 separate chalk pits along the enclosure's inner perimeter. These features might have held wooden posts, or even early stone settings, although their exact purpose remains a subject of speculation. One theory is that they may have served as a boundary for a sacred space, or as a foundational element for the complex that would later emerge. Of course, all of our Interesting theories involve the druids and the speculation on their magic that they would perform. Video on the druids coming up very soon. Shortly after this period, the landscape saw the introduction of timber structures within the Stonehenge site marking a significant phase in the mountain's evolution, monument rather. These wooden constructions are believed to have been used for ceremonial or funerary purposes, as suggested by the cremated human remains discovered in some of the Aubrey holes and elsewhere within the site. The preference for wood a material that eventually decays and merges with the earth, 
may reflect the builder's views on the cyclical nature of life and death, contrasting with the enduring nature of the later stone phases. Of course, the inclusion of wood certainly helps us in carbon dating certain monuments, as it is living matter. Well, the transition from timber to stone signifies not just a change in the materials used, but also a shift in the societal and spiritual landscape of the time. The wooden phase of Stonehenge, while less visually imposing than its stone counterpart, is still crucial for understanding the site's early significance as a center for ritual and commemoration. These constructions were part of a broader sacred landscape that spanned across the Salisbury Plain, indicating a complex network of ritual sites that were interconnected and possibly, just possibly, shared a common spiritual purpose. But we'll speculate a little bit more on that later. The builders of these early phases were undoubtedly drawn to the area by its unique geographical features and its existing ceremonial importance. I mean, if it was already a holy site, why not make it even better? All of this suggests a continuity of sacred activity that would find its ultimate expression, the piece de resistance, in the stone monument. The earthworks and timber structures that predate the stone circles serve as a testament to the deep and enduring connection between the prehistoric people and their landscape. And indeed, what a beautiful landscape it is. You've seen the pictures. It's lovely. Well, they reflect a society that was not only capable of monumental architecture, but also deeply invested in a relationship with the land itself, the sky above, and how both of these things related to the spiritual fabric of their world. Their lived experience was no doubt very entwined with the land that they lived on. Of course, it is also remarkable that people of this age were able to pull off such a feat. As we delve deeper into the story of Stonehenge, moving from wood to stone, we carry forward the understanding of this site as a culmination of generations of human interaction with the land itself. Of course, Stonehenge was not built in a day. It had to go through those prototypes. In its full glory, it emerges not just as an architectural feat, but that sacred space evolving over centuries and reflective of the complex web of human activity, belief, and celestial alignment that defined its construction and use. The stone construction at Stonehenge can be broadly categorized into two main phases, involving different types of stones. The smaller blue stones and the larger sarsen stones. 
Now the blue stones, weighing up to four tons each, were sourced from the Preseli Hills in Wales, some 150 miles away from the Salisbury Plain. The journey of these stones to Stonehenge is a subject of enduring fascination and debate. There are, of course, different theories about their construction. Some theories include transportation by movement of vast human effort, simply dragging them over land, or transporting them by waterways on rafts, kind of the same way that they transported the stones for the pyramids down the Nile. Well, there was even suggestion of glacial action predating human involvement. Well, that moves into a lot of speculation, but the prevailing view credits the monuments builders with this incredible endeavor, highlighting their deep commitment to the site's construction. Of course, if you want the right stones, you have to go out shopping. Really, they could have put up any stones. They could have gotten stones from somewhere that was not 150 miles away, but they chose these specific stones. Now, why is that? Why these stones in particular? Of course, this dimension of the information opens it up to a spiritual interpretation. Were these stones seen as a holy material? Were they somehow blessed by some local Welsh druids? Was it simply that they thought they would look nicer? Well, it had to be a very good reason. Otherwise, you would not have taken the trip. The arrival of the Blue Stones at Stonehenge marked the beginning of a new chapter in the monument's history. The stones were set up in the center of the site, forming a double circle, and then later rearranged into the horseshoe circle that align with key astronomical events, suggesting a sophisticated understanding of celestial movements. Not bad for a bunch of Britons running around in the Bronze Age. Allow us to give them as much credit as they deserve. Following the blue stones, the larger sarsen stones were introduced to the site. And when I say the larger stones, I certainly mean large. Some of which weighed as much as 25 tons. Now these were sourced from the Marlborough Downs, which is indeed quite a bit closer to Stonehenge. But that doesn't make it any less impressive. It still requires significant effort to transport. And once you've transported them, well, you have to stand them up. And that is an entirely different job. I'm sure they took a break for lunch before they did that one. The sarsen stones form the iconic outer circle and trilathon horseshoe arrangement that defines our collective image of Stonehenge. If you have a picture in your head of what Stonehenge looks like, no doubt you are looking at the sarsen stones of the Marlborough Downs. Their precise positioning and the intricate jointing techniques used in their construction, such as the tenon and the mortise joints found in woodworking, well, 
They demonstrate a remarkable level of craftsmanship and architectural knowledge. Once again, we must give them more credit than they are often bestowed with. The architectural design of the site, with its concentric layouts and intentional orientations, of course reveals a understanding of spatial relationships and celestial phenomena. The monument's axis aligns with the summer solstice sunrise, a feature that has led many to speculate about its role as a calendar or astronomical observatory. This alignment, combined with the site's evolving structure, suggests that Stonehenge was not only a place of ritual significance, but also a marker of time, and perhaps even a bridge between the earthly and celestial realms. Of course, every year on the solstice, you can find many very colourful people singing and dancing and convincing themselves of their own enlightenment and some preconceived connection to druidry at the site, enjoying the summer solstice. I don't want to judge, but I think it gets a little bit too crowded for my liking. Now the layout of Stonehenge, incorporating both these blue stones and sarsen stones, is of course a deliberate and sophisticated design. The blue stones, with their mysterious origins and smaller size, offer a contrast to the imposing presence of the sarsen stones. Yet both of these work together into the site's purpose and significance. In constructing Stonehenge, the ancients not only manipulated massive stones with precision and care, but also imbued the landscape with a sense of permanence and sacredness that has endured all the way to our modern era, and will no doubt continue to do so. The monument's stone phases from the initial placement of the blue stones to the grandeur of the Sarsen Circle and Trilithons stand as a testament to the ingenuity of its creators. Now what about the purpose of it? Why would you bother constructing such a thing? Of course, that is something of fascination for everyone, and various theories have been proposed some supported by archaeological evidence, others by historical interpretation, and of course there are plenty out of pure wild stabs in the dark and speculation. Of course, as with most history, the pure speculation theories tend to be the most colourful and interesting. Well, I don't want anybody to assume that the site was not beamed down by aliens. But we should perhaps ask for a little archaeological evidence for this. Who knows, perhaps in thousands of years this will indeed become the prevailing theory of the site. Who can say? Well, the theories range from Stonehenge serving as an astronomical observatory to a burial site. Some people even say that it was the place where the druids used to gather for their magic rituals. You can find many artistic depictions of exactly this. Swaths of white-robed old men with their beards and staffs, looking like a Lord of the Rings cosplay meetup, I'd say. But it's certainly an interesting story, and quite a fascinating vision to uh, meditate upon. 
Of course, one of the most enduring theories is that the site functioned as an astronomical observatory or a kind of ancient calendar. And this theory is supported by the monument's specific alignments. Notably, its primary axis aligns with the sunrise on the summer solstice and sunset during the winter solstice. Such celestial orientation suggests that the builders had a sophisticated understanding of the movements of the sun and possibly other heavenly bodies. Archaeoastronomical studies have further proposed that certain stones could have been used to predict eclipses and equinoxes. Of course, this gives us a complex engagement with the cosmos. And we must remember that the ancients did indeed have a lot of time to look up into that night sky. Indeed, uh, the Sumerians, the Egyptians, were incredibly good at this. The difference is, the Sumerians could write it down. The Britons could not. What a shame. Perhaps we've missed out on some of their ancient knowledge. Well, another prevalent theory is, of course, the sacred religious site. Now, it is supported by the presence of burials and cremation remains found in and around the monument. Well, all of this suggests rituals or ceremonies connected to death and the afterlife. Also, the arrangement of the stones themselves creating a closed circle that separates the inner space from the outside world, could indeed symbolize a boundary between realms, a place where the divine or ancestral spirits could be contacted. A sheer effort involved in constructing Stonehenge also implies a significant or spiritual or religious motivation Think about this. Our ancient monuments of these times were generally constructed to appease some kind of a godlike figure. You may think, well, what about the pyramids? That was just for the pharaoh. Well, indeed, the pharaoh was seen as a godlike figure. Look at our places in Mesopotamia, other parts of Europe, People were always trying to build monuments that would either reach the heavens or be seen as a grand effort that the gods would look down upon them favorably, giving them a nice little gift. Well, archaeological findings play a crucial role in supporting or challenging these theories. Now, the discovery of the Aubrey Holes, for example, initially thought to be post holes for timber structures, were later found to contain human cremation remains. Well, this grants a lot more weight to the theory of it being a burial site. Similarly, the excavation of nearby settlements and additional monuments suggest that Stonehenge was part of a larger ceremonial landscape used over thousands of years, which could support the notion of it indeed being an important religious site, perhaps even a place of pilgrimage for people all across the lands. One may imagine that somebody's grandfather or father many years ago would be saying, bury me at Stonehenge or in the Salisbury Plain, spread my ashes. Maybe so. Now, recent archaeological advances 
including the analysis of human remains using modern techniques, have provided us with many valuable insights into the people who built and used Stonehenge. Isotropic analysis of teeth, that's right, teeth, from buried individuals, indicates that some of the people buried at Stonehenge came from far, far away possibly visiting the site for ceremonial purposes, or, as aforementioned, part of a pilgrimage. Now, all of this suggests a wide sphere of influence, and a significant role not just in the local culture, but in the wider circle of the area. Who knows how far and wide Stonehenge was talked about, indeed a popular tourist destination for our Neolithic ancestry. Well, despite the wealth of theories and the wealth of evidence, the precise purpose of Stonehenge still remains rather elusive to us. A reflection of the monument's complexity, of course, and uh, once more a reminder of the vast temporal distance that separates us from its creators. What does remain clear is that Stonehenge was indeed a site of vast importance, serving multiple functions. We can just list off the main three being astronomical observation, religious worship, and the veneration of the dead. These three seem to be very obvious from the evidence we have. Others? Well, those theories, while being very enjoyable, maybe we have to wait for some more evidence to class them as real history. Well, this multiplicity of purposes, rather than diminishing the monument's significance, only adds to the mystery and allure of Stonehenge, always inviting further exploration and interpretation. The cultural and historical significance of the site stretches far beyond its physical presence on the Salisbury Plain. As a monument, it stands as a testament to the ingenuity of Bronze Age Britain, embodying the era's architectural achievements and its people's connection to the cosmos. The monument's construction, involving communities that likely spanned across different regions, indicates a possibility of a network of cooperation and shared belief systems among the prehistoric peoples of the British Isles. Its role can be seen as multifaceted. And of course the effort required to transport the blue stones from Wales and erect the massive Saracen stones, well, that is something that we can all look upon as a source of pride. The motivations will always remain a subject of speculation. The alignment with the celestial events does suggest that it was there to mark the time and the seasons, serving as a calendar, a place for people to gather and celebrate their ancient Bronze Age rites. A place of life and death highlighting the cyclical view of Neolithic spirituality. Well, in modern times, it continues to captivate our imagination, don't you think? And it symbolizes the appeal of the ancient mysteries. Efforts to preserve Stonehenge and its surrounding landscape have been and will be ongoing with the great people at English Heritage overseeing the site's management. 
There's also a lovely cafe nearby. Preservation efforts have, of course, faced challenges, including balancing public access with the need to protect the site from erosion and damage. A date over the proposed debate, rather, over the proposed tunnel near the site, intended to divert traffic from a highway, exemplifies our modern era in a rather brutal fashion. Well, either way, I don't see this icon of ancient ingenuity going away any time soon. As we continue to study and preserve Stonehenge, we not only honour the achievements of our ancestors, but also we foster that link to the deep past, preserving it for future generations to marvel at and learn from. Stonehenge will continue to hold secrets in its silent majesty, until the time when new humans will discover more about it. In our changing world, we may indeed find out the truth, but we remain fascination with those people of the ancient times who wanted to reach for the stars and created a monument that endures as a beacon of human achievement and mystery. Personally, I hope that the mysteries of Stonehenge remain exactly that, a mystery. Sometimes it is with history when we find out the truth. We have to wrestle with the fact that the truth is very dull, mind-numbingly banal. So maybe we can continue to stay in our speculative phase and let Stone Age, Stonehenge rather, fascinate us further in that way. Well, thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure to speak with you this evening. I hope that you've relaxed and learned something new about Stonehenge. Until next time, make sure you're looking after each other, and most importantly, look after yourself. I'll see you next time. Good night, everybody. <laughs>